As a five-year-old child from landlocked Illinois, I had my first snorkeling opportunity when my family traveled to Rawa Island in the South China Sea. Mask and snorkel on, life vest secured, I plunged into the ocean, and my life was forever changed. Corals cover our tropical oceans from the Indian, the Pacific, and the Atlantic. With the largest coral diversity shown here by that dark triangle between Asia and Australia, Corals have lived on our planet for 500 million years, providing habitat, nurseries, and immense beauty to our oceans. As Sylvia Earle once said, ice ages come and go, but corals persist. Since I first snorkeled 30 years ago, corals have come under increasing threats. Threats from rising sea surface temperatures and lowering sea surface pHs from fossil fuels. Threats from overfishing and increased pollution. And increasingly, our corals look like they do on the left-hand side there in white, where they're facing mortality. Human population density and coral diversity intersect, with more people living inside that circle than out of it, and more coral species living within the triangle than without of the triangle. Yet 75% of our coral reefs are at threat today, and all humans are both to blame and have the most to lose. One of the key threats is overfishing. 20% of our food right now comes from fish protein, and roughly 25% of those fish are reef-based fish. As you can see, the circles growing larger and larger, particularly in Asia over the past 30 years, they represent the increased demand on fishery, which is becoming unsustainable. Compounding this is pollutants. Scientists estimate that exposure to plastics increase coral mortality almost 20-fold once disease hits. Corals provide roughly $375 billion in economic services per year to 500 million people in 90 countries. One of those services is dissipating wave energy before the waves and the storms hit the coast. As corals increasingly die and become threatened and sea levels continue to rise, that service is in decline and our coastal cities are at risk. We also have a scientific um, resource in the form of corals that is often unknown. This is a 500-year-old coral growing off the coast of Vietnam. As it grows, it records the environment that it's growing in, providing us with a record of our climate history and how oceans have played a role in climate change, both natural and anthropogenic. We can take cores from inside those corals and use x-rays to date the coral back through time. We can then measure different chemical structures within that skeleton to reconstruct records, such as sea surface temperature, shown here in green and purple as well as salinity and changes to ocean circulation. They provide us with the knowledge we need to understand ocean's role in climate and how our climate system works. They're very similar to this buoy sitting here. This buoy costs governments tens of thousands of dollars to build and maintain each year. And as corals continue to die, we are losing countless free buoys all over the ocean that can tell us about our climate system and how it works. The most important thing we can do for corals and really all organisms on the planet is to decrease our CO2 emissions. In June, CO2 in the atmosphere increased over 414 parts per million, the highest it's been since humans have been on the planet. But at this point for corals, decreasing CO2 emissions is not going to be enough. We need to take all of our scientific knowledge to make the best choices we can. We need to understand the genetics of corals as this group in Hawaii does and try to identify corals that are able to survive in higher sea surface temperatures and selectively use those to try to restore reefs through coral transplantation. We also need to consider our marine protected areas and our restoration regions carefully, understanding the physical processes of the ocean. This is a satellite view of Palawan in the Philippines showing deep internal waves that bring very cold water up from the surface, cooling our surface temperatures. By choosing regions that are bathed in internal waves daily, we can find coral reefs that are more likely to survive the warming temperatures. We also really need to look at the chemical situations as a whole. In this situation, you're seeing increased nutrient runoff from farming in Louisiana and Florida in water that's already predisposed to red tides. As the nutrients have flown in in the last 10 years, we've seen increasing red tides in these regions. We need to look at places where there are better chemical situations to preserve corals. When my son, five years old, jumped into the ocean with his mask and snorkel the first time, he saw plastics, a lot of them, he saw jellyfish, and he saw beautiful reef-colored fish against a stark white background of bleaching corals. May his children see the color of the coral and the fish.
Thank you very much.